right, so first of all, thanks so much for coming. Um, this is a community event that we put on every few months. Um, and the whole point is to bring the community out, um, share a few stories, um, hopefully embarrass the speakers a little bit, um, and maybe learn a few things as a community. It's really a, an effort to bring some experienced entrepreneurs in and share their stories. Um, my name is Andrew. I'm the program manager uh, at Accelerate Okanagan. And for those who don't know, we've got a whole bunch of people streaming in online, usually about 250 people streaming in online. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, I ask you to please speak into one of the mics um, as they come around. Um, Accelerate Okanagan, um, our mission is to increase the number of technology companies that start and grow here in the Okanagan Valley. Um, and we have two areas of focus when, when we look at accomplishing that mission. And, and on one side of that mission is uh, a program's focus. And that's uh, designing and executing uh, programs to help uh, uh, technology entrepreneurs uh, start, grow, and scale their companies. On the other side of that mission is a, is a major community focus um, that involves a, a wide range of events and activities that are really there to raise the bar in, in the whole community and connect uh, to really create a collaborative um, entrepreneurial community. So this is part of that community mission. Um, as is common at the start of most of our events, um, just want to ask two main questions that come up quite often um, at the start of our events. So first things first, are there any other community events that anyone wants to share with the rest of the community? No one? That would be shocking. Bree? I'll you... share on behalf of the community. <laughs> um, on Friday at 4.30, there's startup drinks happening at CoLab here locally. So startup drinks, for anyone who wants to know, is uh, on 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, you can come and network and meet some other of the local startups and the tech community. All right. I guess we'll leave it at that one. Um, next question that we always start with is if anyone is hiring. And if you are, please say who you are, what you're hiring for, and how to get in touch with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Yashelchman from Catalyst Healthcare. We're hiring two positions right now. One is for a database analyst, and then the other one is for a quality assurance analyst. So if anybody's looking, uh, you can get in touch with me. I'm Allison at uh, catalystrms.com. You can find me on the website. Sorry, what's that? Oh, and a good boss. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Hi, I'm G Ooh, that's loud. I'm Gene. I'm with Cheeky Monkey Media. We're f currently looking for a front-end developer and a technical project manager. So, if uh, you know anybody that you'd recommend, send them our way. We're at cheekymonkeymedia.ca, and you can email me at Gene G E N E at cheekymonkeymedia.ca. Thank you. Is anyone else hiring? Okay. Uh, there's a lot more jobs in this community, so I'd encourage you to check out the job board at AccelerateOkanagan.com. There's about 30 jobs posted every month. All right, so without further ado, um, we will move over. Um, and our guests tonight are uh, Mogan Smed and Scott Jenkins from Dirt. Um, I'm not going to bother introducing the company. I'm going to let them open with a 30-second pitch because um, I'm hoping they do it better than me. So who wants to pitch? Should we have a competition? You can go ahead, Scott. Go <laughs> no, ahead, no, Scott. no. Yeah. You, 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 Mogan's is the founder. All right, so Mogan's, you're up first 30 seconds, and then we'll do a round of applause and see who's better. <laughs> <laughs> well, fundamentally, I grew up in construction and manufacturing, and uh, the company's called DIRT, which stands for Doing It Right This Time. We've already registered our next one. It's called Dip Doing It Perfect This Time because we haven't done it all right this time. But the truth is, is that the way we build and the way that we manufacture is wrong. And what we're trying to do is, and what we are part of is creating a new way of building and manufacturing and, you know, for the benefit from a business and benefit from an environmental benefit and certainly from a personal benefit for the type of environments that we're going to build for the people. All right. 
You're up next. That was pretty good. <laughs> uh, you know, when I meet people, and, and I've learned this from Mogan's, I, I've kind of begun to ask a question. You know, how many people in this room have ever completed a renovation or a construction project? Your house, condo, office? Yeah, most people, right? You've lived through it. Three things I guarantee. It was late, cost you more money than you thought, and the quality was crap. One out of a hundred of people we meet probably in our mutual travels will say, actually, I had a great experience, but we understand what you mean. So our company, we're focused on using technology to change one of the world's oldest industries, construction. And that's probably the best way to put it. All right. What do you think? For Mogans, round of applause. <laughs> and for Scott. That's not fair. I thought his was a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's do some uh, firing quick questions here. Where did you grow up? I was born in Denmark. I came to Calgary in 1952 and been there ever since. My father was a cabinet maker from Denmark. All right. Born and raised Calgary. Father born in Calgary. Grandfather born in Calgary. So I'm kind of a strange breed. All right. So as it relates to BC, we're from the evil empire. <laughs> <laughs> You guys got some white hats floating around, hey? Yeah. A couple? All right. Brothers or sisters? I have five brothers and sisters. I know all Mogan siblings intimately because we do business with them, and we've gotten to know a whole bunch of them well. I've got a sister who's a nurse and a brother who's now moving to Kelowna who's marrying one of your newest doctors at the Kelowna General who just uh, moved here a month ago. Score. <laughs> <laughs> one for us. <laughs> All right. Uh, what did your parents do for a living? Cabinet maker. I said my father was a cabinet maker and my mother was raising children. Uh, my father was a businessman and in the travel business, tour company and travel agent. All right. What was your first job? I worked for my father, started working for him when I was five years old, sorting out, <laughs> nail, sorting out nails and screws. I was a, a box boy at a, a grocery store. And I ended up working there for about three years. Awesome. Um, Mogens, I'm guessing your first entrepreneurial venture was with your father? Uh, no, it was actually on our, on our own. My father, uh, when we finished school, he realized that we were too smart to work for him. So he set us up in our own business uh, on our own. All right. How about you? Uh, we made boxer shorts in high school when I was 16. So I ran a small little company. and. <laughs> With the company logo, and we showed up at parent-teacher interviews wearing our boxer shorts, and all the moms bought us out. The entire stock we had to reorder quickly. Awesome. Are you a CFO? I That's was. That's not very well, typical. I guess uh, <laughs> I, I technically am. I, I guess you, technically I am now. I was, he was but, a CFO. M Mogan's fired me as the CFO. It's his math is bad. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing was he rehired me as president about two seconds later. That's right. About three oh, years ago. It was either that or marketing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, can you give us a brief career journey up to today? Well, real quickly, it's worked for my father. When I, during school and when I finished school, I actually did go to university. It took me five years to get a three-year degree. I was a wonderful poker player. Um, I was too dumb to be a lawyer, thank God. Started in business in 1974 with my brother, went bankrupt in 1982. My father died from the stress of the bankruptcy, seven years younger than I am today. 82 to 2000, we built a business called Smed International that went up to 300 million in sales. We sold that, we're a public company on the NASDAQ. And uh, when you're an entrepreneur, started another company here in 2004 called Dirt. And uh, we're nine years old corporately right now and uh, hopefully on our way to success this time before we get to dipped. <laughs> All right. Uh, university degree in uh, accounting. I don't like to admit that. Uh, but I got fortunate, uh, met a couple of Calgary businessmen. <laughs> with a small technology startup called Pure Technologies, uh, which is now a Toronto Stock Exchange company, was given an opportunity to grow with them, uh, become one of their executives, become their CFO, was involved heavily in marketing, and then I met a young man named Mogan Smed, who thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. And my career kind of took off when I met this guy to my right. All right. Um, so getting into little tougher ones here, um, Dirt, is a technology company, if you dig it under the hood. 
How do you handle questions when people think you're just a builder? Well, <clears throat> we are a builder. You know, and as Scott said earlier on, the difference is we're using technology to bring efficiencies into the business of our company at current volumes. Uh, we have 880 employees. Our old company, when we were doing that much, we had 1,800 employees. You know, it's a completely, the technology is the game changer for us. So, and that's illustrated every day in what we do. Yeah, I think from, you know, a technology standpoint, we're most proud of being a technology company and taking an old industry. I, I think there's a lot of companies out there, and, and I'm not saying we're in the same league yet. I think we will be, of whether it's a Tesla or, you know, some of these larger Silicon Valley companies, some of the companies that many of you know and probably do business with, who are changing old, very large industries by using technology to reinvent the way business is done in that technology. So, yes, we're in construction. But everything we do is based on a foundation of technology. Um, the Globe and Mail um, was quoted by saying that your time to market and your software um, really are the cornerstone of your innovation, um, a disruptive innovation even, they said. Well, construction, you take a look. If you want to build a house here, and if you got off the plane from anywhere and wanted to build a house here, by the time you went through all the process and everything, you're five years before you move in. You know, my wife and I, and along with Scott's wife and self in Dubai, we're sitting there, you know, saying four and a half years we've been in this market, and we're already the dominant force in the healthcare industry in, in the Middle East. And I said, how can some Hicktown company from Calgary, Alberta, come there and dominate a market like that? And first of all, it's because of the partners and, that we have over there that have given us a strategic advantage, but it's also because of technology. Neither Scott or I have ever been to Saudi Arabia, nor do we intend to go there. And we're able to manufacture in our plants in Savannah, Georgia, and Calgary, Alberta, and we can deliver. We ship two weeks out of Savannah, we ship three weeks out of Calgary, regardless of the size of order. You know, we completely speed up and change the whole process and leave the client with something that's far better quality and totally sustainable. So how do you stay ahead of a competition? Do you, ha do you have anyone that's nipping at your heels? Well, you know, I think one of the things that drives our business, and probably many of you in this room, is we are constantly investing. We're a growth company. I, you know, one thing that I truly believe for us, and I'm most proud of when I'm out there talking to investors and, you know, Mogens and I are out traveling, is we've got a chip on our shoulder. We think we're a startup. You know, we're 880 employees now. You know, we're a TSX. I mean, we're pretty good size. We're nowhere near where we want to be. But we still think we're the little guy in the ring. We use the same business strategy as we do in our personal life. I uh -oh, tell my this wife. This is where it gets ugly. No. <laughs> I basically, I said, Dar uh, my wife, I said, darling, I may not be that good today, but wait till you see us tomorrow. And that's, and that's what we do in business is that we spend $10 million a year in innovation. We did it the first eight years. We spent $100 million and never made a dime. But we committed to innovation. Innovation is everything. You will not survive if you don't innovate. You will be yesterday's news so quickly. Take a look at the Northern Telecoms. Take a look at BlackBerry. Take a look at Sun Microsystems. They don't even exist today because they quit innovating. So how do you maintain that culture now that you're a company of 880 employees? Well, I think, you know what? It's relentless. It's work. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. One thing we're really proud of. Uh, greatest irony in our company. We build walls. Nobody sits in an office. Open plan. Two of our founders, including myself, don't have a desk. You know, it takes work. It takes effort. Uh, whether it's social activities, whether it's engagement with the customer, our distribution partners, our suppliers, and getting them to buy into what we're trying to change. You know, getting people to understand that we're we think we're really reinventing one of the world's oldest industries. And here's the vision. You know, here's the vision that Mogens and Barry Loberg and Jeff Gosling, when they, they first created the company that I joined a little while after, came you know, and said, this is what we're going to do, and we got to keep on that soapbox. And it's work. It's the same here when we bought this factory spider in Kelowna here a few years ago. First of all, strategically, we had to buy them because 
They had this tribal knowledge and incredible idea of how to deal with electrical systems. The journeyman electric might be able to make, populate four or eight gang boxes in a day and hook them up. We do 100 a day with one person. You know, and that development and that idea uh, was right here in Kelowna. And when we said, well, no manufacturer, when we were told that no manufacturer had ever succeeded in Kelowna, you know, maybe that was our motivation because we've been very successful here and we're happy being here. It just goes to show that we're completely different than a normal manufacturing company. All right. Where did the uh, name Dirt come from? Oh, that's all yours. Yeah. Uh, well, we have 880 employees, no MBAs, and no lawyers. We don't need anybody telling us we can't do it. We don't need people telling us what the problems are. We need a whole company focused on the vision. That's just the way it is. And in our old business, we took that company from zero to 52 million in 1995 to 300 million in 1999. Big companies buy you because they can't do it themselves and they bought us. They paid a lot of money for it. And today that company does less than $30 million. It had 2,600 employees and they took it. And I'm adamant, if you took everything that Scott and I are talking about here and you put a different group of people, a different culture, they turn it into nothing overnight. I don't care how good your technology is. I don't care how good your products are. Don't fall in love with them. It's the people and the culture that you create. That's what drives our business. The name Dirt came from after six months after they bought our company, they paid a huge amount of money. I came home to my wife and I said, Nikki, I said, these guys don't mean to do it, but they're screwing it up. I don't know why they spent $300 million on the on the company. They're screwing up. And that night, standing in the shower, I know this was sober, one of the rare sober ideas I've ever had. <laughs> I came up with the name Dirt and registered it. You know, had no idea that we'd be doing this. Yeah. All right. Um, when you started Dirt, um, I understand that you got your first orders before you had a proper product in place. Like, can, can you talk about this? Like, how do you balance product development and customer development? There's nothing more important in life than loyalty. Nothing. Relationships and loyalty. Yeah, we sold $20 million in our first year. And you're damn right. So it's relationships and the vision that we sold and the idea that we sold. There was a lot of sympathy business in there, no doubt about it. And we're lucky we got paid for, let alone not sued for some of the things we did in that first 20 million, and we lost 15 million in the first year. But darn it, there's nothing that replaces loyalty. Any company that succeeds, they've got loyalty to their employees, or you won't get loyalty from them, and you have loyalty from your clients, or you will not succeed. The most profitable companies in the world and successful ones are those ones that have loyalty, both with their people and their clients. Do you do you have a program to sort of nurture that loyalty with your customers and employees? Well, I, I think we just relentlessly focus on the customer. You know, one thing I'm most proud of is, you know, could be Mogan's, could be myself, could be anybody on our team. We take somebody to our facility here in Kelowna. We don't do a lot of the talking when we're walking around. We let our team do it here in Kelowna because they're all shareholders. They're all option holders. They're all folks that have worked for us. They've all met clients on regular tours. Let them talk about what they're doing. Let them tell about where this is going. They're shipping something for a client in Connecticut in the U.S. or maybe for a U.S. military base. We were talking about this earlier about in Korea. You know, that's going to come right out of the facility here in Kelowna for Camp Humphreys in South Korea. Let them talk about it. So it's just kind of, so there isn't a loyalty program. It's just that we're customer-centric. We are all about the customer throughout the organization. It doesn't matter who you are. The customer comes first. And if you take, you know, your, your emphasis on technology, every order that Google's done in Mountain View in the last six years, we've done it. You know, and this is a company, sadly, that's run by accountants. But, you know, we're the only ones that can run at the same speed that they can. We're doing the campus for Netflix in Los Gatos. You know, they're all tough clients, but they're, no matter what, they realize we do what we say we're going to do. Our company is not run by marketing and sales or we would have anarchy. It's not run by operations or we'd be only be making widgets. It's not run by finance or we'd be doing less than 10 million a year. It's run by the customer. That's our boss and that's who we're committed to. Yeah, you, you talk in many interviews about empowering your employees. 
as you were saying, to sort of be the, the front face is, I mean, do you have any good stories about cost, about your sort of your employees rather um, taking the lead as opposed to you guys? I, you know, I, I like to talk about when I first met Mogans back in 06, I learned early on that our entire culture is based on entrepreneurship, which is one of the things actually why I think it's kind of, you know, we're, we're very excited to be at this event tonight. Um, I, I like to joke, you know, our culture is, and, and this is led by moments, is you're given enough rope to swing from the tree or hang yourself. You know, you, we're all our own business owners within our business. And we're given enough for, you know, leeway to go, go do what we need to accomplish. Um, hopefully you get it right or you're going to hear about it awfully quick. <laughs> the other end. So, all right. I well, I have, a, I, have an, yeah. I have another story that goes on top of that goes back to when my brother and I were maybe 11 or 12 years old and we're in the shop and um, we asked my dad, said, Dad, what should we do here? And he said, thank God I just saved a whole bunch of money. Well, why? He says, well, now I get your paycheck. If I have to make decisions for you, then I get your paycheck because that's what I pay you for is to make decisions. But Dad, we don't know what to do. And then he said, then figure it out. And you know what? And that was the strongest lesson I... We operate the same way through our entire company. Any idiot can tell you got a piano on your foot. Tell us a little bit of a solution, and then we can work it out. FIO, figure it out. Um, when did you decide to bring Scott on board as a president? He still how hasn't do, decided. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you get to a point when you know you need a president and a CEO? Well, first of all, a business is. It, it kind of, it, it just evolves. Our old company was a company that grew from a small entrepreneurship to a public company on the NASDAQ and the Toronto Stock Exchange. And the most important that you have to recognize is, is that what you're, who you are is, like my father said, there's only two things you need to know in life. And for Morgan's, for you, the first one's going to be real hard is that you're not the smartest guy in the whole world. And you're going to meet people every day that are way smarter than you, you know, and... Hopefully, if you have any brains at all, you'll have them working with you, not for you. You know, and the second thing is, is that nobody knows your business better than you. But you need to know who you are, and then you need to hire the people and have the people around you that will complement your weaknesses as opposed to, and that's, you know, I, what Scott does, uh, he's especially active in the financial community, and I can tell you that uh, I'd rather pull my nails out than sit in front of uh, an analyst or a, a, a institutional fund, because that's not my bailiwick, and Scott does that part of it. On the other hand, I don't think he'd like dealing with a contractor that's threatening to sue you either, you know, because his job isn't getting done on time. All right, so that's pretty much how you split the role? He, he does the stuff you hate? No, well, I do the stuff he hates too, right? Yeah. Or everybody. We have everybody that does it. I, well, yeah. let me add to that. Like, I think with Mullins and I, it's worked out well. It just, like, it didn't, it wasn't that we put a pen to a piece of paper. It just happened. Yeah. You know, we worked together. And, there, and there, there's also a, a bigger team behind us. You know, our, yeah. our other co-founders, Tracy Baker, yeah. our COO. It, it's, it, and it does change over time, you know, as we're growing. Um I think, you know, people ask me when I became the president, Mogan's first started talking to me about four years ago, I think, yeah. ish, I, I don't even remember. My job actually didn't change. You know, our board, other people thought, you know, there was a change. There was not, nothing that changed. It was mm -hmm. just the way it was evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, good organizations let, I think, our teams and the yeah. people that we work with, who are probably the smartest people that, that we're working with, let them go where they can do the most good. Yeah. Yeah, when well, we do this, Jeff Gosling and Barry Loberg are two of the most incredibly smart people you'll ever meet. Jeff does our, uh, our product development and solutions. He's working tonight on a solution that we're kind of screwed up on, and he'll come up with something by tomorrow morning. I know he will. Or Barry Loberg, as it relates to the technology, he sees the world in a completely different way. It's something that a lot of you can relate to. When I hear you that you need programmers and you need... Uh, uh, project managers, we can't get them in Calgary or Salt Lake City. I don't know how you're going to get them here. You know, you can get a lot of them that call themselves programmers and project managers, but, you know, they just can't do the job. So thank God we have people like Jeff and Barry that are able to sort of take control of those situations. Mm -hmm. um, 
As you got started with the company, um, do you remember your first international deal? Was it in that first twenty million that you already mentioned, or no? Um, it, it, uh, it came as a result of having an American client that was doing a job elsewhere in the world. Our very first international deal, quite frankly, was in our second year of business. That was our Allied World, uh, Allied World Assurance Corporation. You know, along with the crooks on Wall Street, the insurance companies, AIG, were just as crooked. And they set up a company called Allied World Assurance Corporation in Bermuda. And uh, the building was connected right to the AIG building. That's how transparent this whole thing was. And we got a $5 million order for them in our second year of business. Little did they know that we weren't capable of doing the job. Yeah. So we did it twice. Yeah, yeah. At least. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it wasn't so much a decision to go global. It was just sort of happened. No, our clients are the ones that drive us there. Okay. That's what they're, and our industries drive us there. Healthcare, you know, whether we like it or not, North America is a Luddite society. Look at the hospital they just built in Kelowna. It's already, uh, it was out of date five years ago, let alone what it was. It's disgusting the way they build it. You know, and we're the ones that are going to pay for it. You know, whereas the people in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and now in Singapore, they understand, you know what I mean, we're not going to spend the money if we're just throwing it away, which is very un-Canadian and un-American, you know, and there, there, are, there are not Luddite societies like we live here in the United States and Canada. We go with the opportunities where they will think in a different way. We need them to think in a different way, not necessarily the way we think, but they certainly buy into what our approach is. So when you are you looking for new markets or are you looking for new customers regardless of the market? You can ask. I, you know, I I think the best way to put this and you know not to, it, maybe for those in the room, there's a lesson I learned in my prior career to Dirt about a shotgun approach to international expansion and just chasing dreams and flying all over. The, you know, I'd love to. We we had a board member who's no longer with us, thank God. Who uh, said, "Oh, we should go to Brazil. We're a construction company, technology. There's a lot going on in Brazil. I could have a lot of fun in Brazil. We don't have any customers. We don't have any relationships down there. What would we do?" So our international expansion, I like to kind of give the term rifle shot. It's where we have strong partners who have existing local relationships, or there's a very specific market need for our solution. Singapore being a good example, where they have to import all their construction labor and materials. And they're trying to plan for the future. I don't know what the future holds. I.e., great, great spot for us to operate. All right. Um, as companies grow, some of the some of the issues that come up here in town regularly, I would say top three, and and these are some of the ones we see across Canada, even even across the planet, are access to capital, uh, customer acquisition, and sort of operations. Those seem to be sort of top three challenges as you're as you're scaling a company. Is that consistent with your, your business? Yeah. Well, Canada, Canada, we, you know, we're anti-business, <clears throat> you know, and raising... I think we're pretty pro-business here. Yeah, I know, but in Canada, we're anti-business. <laughs> I mean, raising $100 million of private equity was not easy, you know, to especially when you're making no money, you know, and uh, to a great extent, that's one of the reasons we went public is, is that it was really a financing event for us. It was just too darn hard, and we had to give up way too much to get where we got. Okay. Was, is that your, still your top challenge, access to capital, or has it no, changed? No. Uh, now it's getting enough business. Okay. All right. Um, and is this sort of a, a drawn-out strategy that you have, or is it just that your pure customer focus? Well, I think for us, we, you know, the, you hit a, it, and all of your industries, and I don't know, I haven't had a chance to meet most people in the room, but your businesses are going to be different than ours. And there's a critical mass, I believe, in every business. Uh, for us, it's a big critical mass, and we need to get there. It took a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. um, and now the leverage in our business model is really coming through. And that's, again, going back to, because we're a technology company. But it took us, it's a lot of hard work to get here. You know, we, the funny story, Mogens and I, 2008, with uh, the folks out of Vancouver, yeah. who they, they invested in us, and it was kind of a, a last-minute decision, and they really took a leap of faith. Um, but, wow, were we, it was touch and go there. 
And uh, I don't so, know. If, I don't know if our company would be around if we didn't receive that financing yeah. at that time. That's how we bought Spider. Yeah. We, we raised. We've been on the road for six months, Scott and I, trying to raise money. We raised a grand slam total of two million dollars out of twenty-two, and we basically, the right at the last second, talked these guys into it and gave us the money. We had to. We had six days to come up with a check for a twelve million dollar acquisition here in Kelowna with Spider. All right, stressful days, huh? Normal. Well, we had a nice lunch in Vancouver after they agreed. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a very nice lunch. Yeah. Where did you go? <laughs> what was it? It was a nice Italian El restaurant. El yeah. Giardino. Yeah, yeah, now Margaret, who we ran into, yeah, works yeah, for yeah. us. Yeah. All right. Um, so, Scott, this is uh, really for you. How, how does it feel working for, I would say, a, a serial entrepreneur as a founder? Well, I'm glad you said serial entrepreneur and not serial something else. <laughs> Uh, it's great. You know, one of the things with Mogens, and I appreciate, and I don't get to say this to him enough, but I, you know, I mean this um, completely from the bottom of my heart, is he empowers the entire team, and I have been given an opportunity to be an entrepreneur and drive the business as hard and fast as I can and contribute wherever I can. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's with analysts, investors, whether it's in sales and marketing capacity, whether it's in operations. We really have an attitude of just get it done. Mogan surrounds himself with good folks. He and I have some huge fights, usually in closed doors. The thing that pisses me off the most is he's usually right. It, I've been given a great opportunity, but we work hard, we play hard, and when you're passionate about what you're doing, it's not really work. Mm -hmm. um, as you guys scale, how do you, how do you change the way that you measure your company? In a startup, you're trying to find a model. How's that differ now? We don't change anything. Yeah. It's still, you know, our two. We have two models: get the business and service the hell out of it. And you can't ever change that. The day that we start any, and that's one of our biggest battles is 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 allowing, you know, bureaucratic behaviors to sneak in there. You know, the uh, bureaucracy can be a synonym for process if you allow it to be and you have to make sure that you don't let that sneak into your business that's part of doing it right this time you know we like to blame our people like to blame the company that bought us for some of the bad behaviors that contributed to, to you know the ultimate demise of our old business but the truth is we put them we let them happen in the beginning and they just inherited it mm -hmm. and so you said bureaucracy can be a synonym for process right but you guys are certainly a fairly Process-driven manufacturer. Darn right. <laughs> All right. But not bureaucracy. Fair enough. All right. Um, let, let me add a little bit to that. The process for us, you know, using our ICE technology, our design technology, uh, ICE is always evolving. So the process is evolving, right? We're trying to figure out better ways to do it and challenging. You know, when we went from four-week order time to three-week, now pushing to two weeks, we're challenging ourselves nonstop. Mm -hmm. I, I think one thing that's pervasive in our organization is just because we did something this way last week doesn't mean that's the way we should do it next week. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any sort of ways to recognize that sort of disruption inside your company or ways to uh, pull that out of your employees? You to have help to have that? a culture of change. Yeah. They know we're going to change. Yeah. That's the way it is. They expect change. If they don't see change, mm -hmm. they actually get nervous. You know, we don't make change for the sake of making change. We just realize that we don't want to end up like Northern Telecom. We don't want to end up like these other guys, and we will. Jobs that we would have won five years ago, we're losing right now because the market's catching up to us in certain areas, and we got to. That's why we're moving into vertical markets like healthcare and education and next residential. You know, we've got to be moving away from where the conventional market is all the time. Mm -hmm. So you are switching into residential. Absolutely. Or not switching, but yeah, but not switching. They, jumping you know, in as well, but you know, there's a huge opportunity there. You know, prefab for residential. I, what, I what have uh, some about? drywall ripped down at my house right now. We don't use drywall. <laughs> I know. You How's know, that going for you? Terrible. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Well, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know. Let me ask you. Next to food and water, what's more important than where we're going to live? Where our children are going to live? How we build? Mm -hmm. Here in North America, we built shit here. You know what I mean? We do. Uh, by the way, environmental criminal that I am with an 
8,500 square foot on uh, square foot house on Cars Landing that no one will buy. You know what I mean? The point is, is that we can live comfortably in 900 feet or 1,000 square feet. We can live in a house. You take a look at St. Hubert is here. There, that house there, right on facing due west. There's no air conditioning in that house, and it's cooler than any other damn house that's got air conditioning here in the valley. The way we build, you know, the garbage that we build, you know, our motto is let's build a home that our great grandchildren can live in, you know, and let's build a home, you know what I mean, that we'll be proud to live in. So, uh, one of the things that I, I really admire about your company is that you look at both an environmental and social lens. That seems to be pervasive through your company. Why are those things important to you? Uh, you know, the best way to put it is, is probably just our team and the people we hire or the folks that started the company, I think, is just part of their moral compass. Like, we, we use the term stakeholder, not shareholder. Yes, we're a public company. Yes, we raise money both privately and now publicly because we have goals and where we want to be. But we believe in all of our stakeholders. That's your community. So that's Kelowna is one of our home communities throughout North America. That's the folks that work for us. That's their family members. Uh, that's our suppliers. That's our customers. That's folks that we meet at an event like this. Like, you got to look at all stakeholders. And I think companies that do that generally in the long run are more successful. We're not doing it because we, it's because we want to be more successful, but we know it is helping to drive our success in taking a stakeholder mentality versus shareholder. And then, you know, Mogan's, you know, he's crapping on North American companies, but he's right. You know, it's all shareholders, especially, you know, not to shit all over the U.S., but, you know, you know, quarter to quarter earnings, quarter to quarter earnings. We're a company that's focused on long term. We've been successful in the last few years. It's been great for us, but we know at some point we might take our lumps, but we're focused on the long term. And so how do you manage that relationship with uh, your investors who I'm sure are also looking at quarter over quarter results? Easily. You know what? When we show the kind of gross margins that our company can bring versus any other manufacturer, not just in North America, but in the world, you know, and that we show them our motto is if it costs more, it ain't green. We haven't had a price increase since we started. We never will have. You know what? It's the way that that's what technology does for you and, and that's what a growing business does for you. That you know how we produce, how efficiently we produce, that our factories run 84 hours a week, you know, that our people work four on and four off. How we use our, our capital assets, our space, our equipment. It's a completely different behavior. How we design our products. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a completely different thing. I, I would add one one thing, you know one thing that that's been beneficial for Dirt is obviously you have Mogens who built a very successful business that was sold back in two, 2000. 2000, yeah. Um, so there's some shareholders that, that participated back in that day that saw that things could be volatile. It was a tough business back then yeah. in the office furniture industry. So they've invested in us because they, they, they're buying into the long term. We have then also gone out and sought shareholders that are somewhat aligned. Hasn't been perfect. You know, sometimes you just need the capital, otherwise making payroll tomorrow might be a challenge. But I think we've done a good job now in aligning ourselves with shareholders who are also long-term focused. Mm -hmm. Not perfect, but that, that's been, uh, I've definitely seen that in the last two years. And we've never had a layoff. Never. We get rid of somebody that's no good or they quit, but we've never had a layoff. Our most valuable asset is our people. Here, when we bought this factory in Kelowna, perfect timing, right at the beginning of the recession. <laughs> we didn't lay them off. They were out working in the community here. You know, if there's ever time to build loyalty, you know, you have to show loyalty before you can demand it. And it's, it's, it's a cultural thing, but it's also something that builds to the strength, that does build to the strength of our business. Mm -hmm. Do you expect your suppliers to hold the same values as you hold with your social and environmental lens? They may not be able to, you know, if they don't have the technology, if they're tethered to a commodity price like oil or aluminum or steel, you know, they can't do what we can do in, in a lot of cases. And that's a big challenge. That's one of the biggest challenges in this area. There's no secondary industry. So when we want to get a piece of sheet metal or something like that, these shops have, that have gone by the wayside, 
you know, they have to have much smaller overheads and, and, and it's hard, it's really hard for them to survive, really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are some of the outcomes that you've had, positive or negative, by having such strong values like that? Well, I go back to Mullen's previous comments. You know, you got to demonstrate loyalty before you demand it. Um, we have a young lady who works for us in Savannah. You know who I'm talking about already, probably. Yeah, yeah. Who uh, she used to work for a manufacturer in Savannah. They shut down their operations uh, just as the recession was hitting. We opened our, <laughs> so we bought Spider right at the beginning of the recession, and then we opened our facility in Savannah in May 2009, right in the recession. Awesome. So if you don't think we're nuts already, you now you have proof we're nuts. Uh, but she came to work for us, and then they their operation, it's a big international manufacturer. Great Dane trucking. Yeah, I was going to use the, yeah. I was worried because the, there's a, bad, a, a bit of a bad trucking stigma in this valley yeah. from an old company <laughs> oh, yeah. there as well. And uh, but they didn't treat their employees very well. And but now they're doing very well. And they've tried to hire some of the folks, but they've tried to hire Teresa back um, and offered her pretty fantastic. She'll be with us for another twenty years. She told them where to stick it. One of the best chefs in the Okanagan Valley is our chef at uh, Spider here in Kelowna. You know we have in-house chefs and and restaurants for every for every one of our factories. We so, screw them, we charge them two bucks a day. Yeah. <laughs> I've been. It's, yeah, it's yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the stories I heard about, uh, specifically, I, I believe it was the kitchen here, is you guys did an audit of your your environmental footprint, and one of the biggest Im impacts was people leaving the office for lunch. Yeah. Is that true? Is that why? Well, it's across our company. Think okay. about, what, you know, how... How do you, you got to get up from work and if you don't bring your own lunch and then you drive to a restaurant, if you can find one, you know, you spend a bunch of money, a bunch of hydrocarbon expenditure, not to mention all the other things that go along with it. And, and we also do healthy food, you know, the whole thing. It's, it, you know, it, it, you know, you know, it may sound socialist, but we're right wing capitalists. And one of the best wing, best ways to do it is treat your people proper. Mm -hmm. So... Um, speaking of your people, um, I've heard they're called dirt bags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? The name dirt. All their, right. Their kids are called dirt baguettes. <laughs> yeah. What do we call our wives? I can't remember. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> oh, jeez. The boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so one, one of the things that, things that uh, seems to be coming up in the entrepreneurial landscape quite a bit is uh, what could be called like your inner game. Um, and I don't mean like your entrepreneurial skills. I mean more like mental health and stress management or leadership, things like that. Do you guys, do either of you do anything to keep healthy both like physically and mentally? He does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, from a few years back uh, about our company. So M Mogan's, because he's crazy like a fox, he uh, he was out here spending a few weeks with his wife, and uh, I think he was going stir crazy. So rather than phone me and say, hey, come out, spend a few days at Spider, and then you know maybe we'll talk business, and he phones my wife directly and convinces her that she has to come out for a week with our newborn, who's three months old at the time. Meanwhile, he's planning so we can go golfing, then we go visit some investors in Vancouver. But what he knew is that his wife, Nikki, you put a three-month-old in the house, and he's off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, Mogens also knew that we were working pretty hard back then, and we had just completed a private financing. Things were pretty stressed, and we all probably needed a break. What I also remember, another funny story, if you remember, is you were beating me by about 10 strokes after nine holes, and you started to phone every member of our board of directors yeah. to tell them that you were kicking my ass. It doesn't happen much. I can tell you that, yeah. <laughs> That's just our culture. I, you know, it's a little window into who we are. We, when you're passionate about what you do, yeah. like everybody is hurt dirt. I think that's what drives us. Okay. Yeah. And you, Mogens, do you do anything sort of on your inner game? Um, let's see. I did push-ups this morning. All right. No, they, uh, the truth is, is that you know, our, our goal really is <clears throat> to make sure that we have a, a common vision, you know, and... Uh, I always say the day that I can meet 
a 40-year-old that has more energy than I do, then I'll quit. You know, and uh, I live a relatively healthy lifestyle. I travel a lot, you know, but, but still, uh, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not a big drinker or a big eater. And, uh, and, I, and I try to manage it. And I travel on my own, too, so it makes a lot of difference that I don't have to, that Scott does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, back to your employees, nobody has job titles. Um, I heard you even just earlier tonight passing a card to Ron, and there's no title on it. How does that, how does that work for your employees? E well, you know, I like to hang, hand out Mogan's cards when I go out you know, in New York and I'm at a club <laughs> and say, call me. Um, I think it makes a statement. It, it's, we don't do it for a marketing reason. It's just who we are. It, it, it's, it's for a legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. It's we are our names. Mm -hmm. Here's my direct line. Here's Mogan's direct line. Mogan, you know, Mogan spends a... A letter, our, our monthly kind of company marketing newsletter, we call it Digging It. And so there's a message from Mogan's every month. And at the bottom, it, you know, obviously it's his name, but it's his cell phone number. Well, our the, clients can call us. Yeah, titles create, you know, unnecessary competition. You know, and t uh, titles create entitlements. Hmm. You know, you have to earn. Your, what you do every single day and the other thing is is that when you're in entrepreneurship then you don't get those silos when you have titles I'm the director of marketing or I'm the director of operations and all that I mean that's that's what happens that's the whole MBA thing you know these poor kids that are coming out they're smart as hell with their MBAs they can't get a job because they're expecting to be the president or the vice president of the organization and you know we've all learned that there's no replacement for experience I have an MBA. Uh, I told you that the first I time I met you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had to tell you when I graduated, I got a job, a 100% commission sales job with Xerox. And Way to go. Then I was okay in your books. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. were certainly not happy with me. <laughs> um, sorry, just finding my place here. Um, with your talent, you, you said you've never laid anyone off. How, so that's your strategy on never losing anyone. How do, you, how do you bring people on? How do you decide sort of who comes on? What do you search for? That sort of thing. It's darn hard to get hired by us. It really is. It's kind yeah. of like a club, you know, and we don't, we don't need when we, like in Calgary, you come to our Calgary factory, you'll see there's a ping pong table there. There's a foosball table. It's because we don't want or need more people. We feel that it's too easy to throw bodies at the problem. It's solving the problem, either through better processes or, or uh, other efficiencies. You know, that way you don't overhire. That was a mistake that we made in our old business. We overhired, and we just don't want that to happen. You know, I'm sure for many people in this room, you know, when you asked the first two questions before we got started, like, we're challenged finding great folks. But it's not necessarily great folks who on paper, you know, they went to school, they have this, they have that. It's great. It's Look, we're a different company. Great folks to us may not be, they might be great folks to somebody else. It doesn't mean they're great folks for dirt. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge in Calgary. It's a challenge for us in Kelowna. It's a challenge in Salt Lake. Pro programmers, talented programmers, you know, that's uh, folks who have, have experience at problem solving and have good people skills. It's, that's tough. You're like a normal tech company. We're, it's, it's, you know, uh, Barry and I, so Barry, one of the co-founders with Mogans, uh, when we were in Dubai three or four weeks ago, we had a long conversation about it. You know, where do we find talented people nowadays? Did, so what did you come up with? We, we, we're not sure. Uh, one thing I think we're pretty proud of is we have a very low turnover rate um, for all of our operations across North America because who we are, uh, referrals, you know, looking at innovative ways. You know, we wanted to hire a skywriter. That idea got tossed pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. Um, no solution. The start of your company um, is somehow connected to the game Doom. Have any of you guys played Doom? Yeah, a couple of people. But oh yeah, more than a few. So can you guys talk about how? It's simple. How that started. Barry, Barry, 
First of all, Barry has a grade 12 education. That's all he's got. And when I say all, that's what he's got. And he's got, I don't know, 60 some computer engineers and programmers working for him now. And what he made money at coming out of school was doing uh, 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 computer walkthroughs. And he had like 25 computers hooked together to do this animation of a walkthrough of space so that he basically hooked them up and he was gonna wait around till tomorrow morning when it was all coming out. And then he walks by these young kids that are playing this game Doom and they're doing it real time. And that's what gave him the inspiration for what we, what Dirt's strength is that we've been able, and our patent and our biggest property is that we've been able to take the gaming technology, which of course is far and away the biggest industry in the whole, uh, in, in the world today in that regard. And he applied it to an engineering and design tool is what he did. All right. Um, you also partner with Oculus Rift? You know that one, yeah. <laughs> how, how, how does a building company do that? <laughs> well, well, one how of does the Facebook things. do it? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> we, well, we've talked already a lot tonight about continuous innovation <laughs> and thinking outside the box. So uh, our guys and Barry and, and one of our young uh, young guys on the team who really was reading about this, we got our hands on an early prototype, very early. Like, it's actually crazy to think how early we had a prototype. And we thought, what if you could actually put on 3D uh, goggles and walk through your space rather than looking at your construction drawings or going into Home Depot and looking at a little paint swatch or you know trying to imagine your space? Um, what if you could actually build on that collaboration? One of the challenges with construction is it's, it's such a dysfunctional process for everybody. You know, you don't know what your contractor, your architect, your designer, your builder, your engineer, everybody's got different sets of drawings and different, I don't know, renderings. And so Barry kind of put together with his team and said, well, what if we could start walking through this space? Now it's cutting edge, like virtual reality, right? Like they haven't been able, like they're still at a prototypical stage. They're hoping to get it cost level down to about 500 bucks for the video game industry. But it's, it was a natural for us. It was building on video games. It's building on one of the biggest, you know, something that there's a lot of companies in this valley know about. Mm -hmm. And so why can't we take that into construction? And is it working? Well, it is. It makes me sick, put yeah. it this way, because they walked me over a ledge. There's something about walking off a 10th floor building that <laughs> yeah. gives you the creeps. But the point is, is that it's part of our long-term vision because it's not too far away. Certainly in the next 70, in the next 72 months, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter, that everybody will insist if we, you, you will insist on walking through your new home and seeing exactly how it works, how the kitchen works, how the bathroom works. And by the way, Dirt will be making the world's best bathrooms for all you ladies. There's no doubt about it. We're launching them in London, England, and Chicago this year. Um, it's the ability to get that real life experience and the combination of what ICE can do, or which is our software, and what, you know, leveraging all the power of a Panasonic or a Facebook, who I don't think they'll pull it off because they don't understand it. But, you know, there's several companies that are doing it, and we'll be able to take advantage of it and create a whole different client experience. Awesome. Um, to close things off here before we open it up to the crowd, a few more personal questions. Um, who do you look for for mentorship and why? Well, my mentor just died a few months ago. His name was Ed McNally from Big Rock Breweries. And Ed was a friend. I was on his board for a long time. And, and what he did, he, has a, he had an ability to look at the world in a different way. Big Rock will never be the same now that he's dead. I can tell you that. It was, he was the company. But my God, he was a genius in marketing. Those of you who've been in Alberta and Saskatchewan and seen those hay bales, I remember we get this big proposition from an advertising company. They want $450,000 for doing all these billboards and all that. Uh, Ed, by the way, who wouldn't step on top of a dime and he could tell you whether it was heads or tails, wasn't paying four fifty. I can tell you that. And they came up with this thing where these farmers actually provide the hay bales and they wrap the, you know, the outside of their beer cans and it's ubiquitous in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and you know, of course, he sells his beer out here. So he was a great mentor because he was really a grounded individual, very creative. Mm -hmm. 
And you look for him for that sort of grounding? Uh, I wouldn't call either one of us grounded. He's very, <laughs> you know, he was quite eclectic, I can tell you that right now. He really was. But No, but I mean, but the point is, is that he was always thinking in a creative way. He, in his, he had a farm, and, you know, he... You know, binder twine is a big thing on the farm. He knew how to make it work. And sometimes we try to go into some really fancy, sophisticated approach to solving a very simple problem. And he knew how to, and his approach was coming up with a more efficient way of doing it. All right. How about you, Scott? Well, you know, obviously I can give you the suck hole answer that this guy beside me is one of my greatest mentors, but it's true. Um, <laughs> He's full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I was lucky that I, I joined a, a small technology company uh, early on that also grew rapidly, and the guys who started that company at Pure did a great job. You know, I, I'd probably say my grandmother. I uh, grew up with a Ukrainian grandmother who uh, her husband left her and raised my mother and her sister from when they were four and two, and her and I, me being the oldest boy, were very close and uh, hard work. Taught me, doesn't matter if you keep working, you keep plugging away, you'll be successful. She mm -hmm. taught me a work ethic that I think uh, has served me well. All right. Um, as an organization and as a community, I think we we really do try to be collaborative and helpful. Um, what do you guys need help with? Orders. <laughs> All right. That's the whole thing. My my father hated salespeople. <clears throat> Because he said they spend way too much time on business and relationships they don't have and not near enough time on the business and the relationships they already have. And we build our business on maintaining relationships. Like here in, in this community, Hyper Hippo right beside us, or Loose Change, or uh, Peel Law, Uni University of British Columbia. Those are clients. We want clients, lifetime clients, but we need more of them. And the more we build that base, you know, the stronger we're going to be. We don't rely on big, huge contracts. We're real happy with Procera here on the other side that we did, you know, being able to work in this community and building this community. We pay just as much attention to Kelowna, British Columbia, as we do to Houston, Texas, which is our biggest market. All right. What keeps you up at night? You know, like everybody, I think, in business, it used to be capital, access to capital, right, to achieve our goals. That was a big, big challenge. You know, one of the nice things when we took our company public is uh, it was a financing event to us. I think Mogens was mentioning that earlier. Um, so it wasn't about being public. We just needed access to capital to try to grow this. It's really just Chapter 2 for us. Uh, so now I'd say it's people, maintaining our culture. We've talked a lot about that tonight. And when you become a bigger company, how do you do that? I just constantly or you know relentlessly have to work on it. Mm -hmm. so. Same for you. Uh, no, uh, it's a little different. Uh, for me, I, I just see what where we should be, and you know, people say this about me that I only have varying levels of dissatisfaction, but that's <laughs> the truth. You know what I mean? As as an entrepreneur and as an individual, you know you can be a lot better, and I'm. Just, I'm shocked that we're not twice as big as we are already. Not for the sake of being big. Is I'm sad that the, we haven't. The market in general hasn't embraced our ideas because they have such great value, and they really do. You know, not just from uh, an environmental point of view, but from a financial point of view. And this Luddite society has a hard time understanding what we do, and maybe that's us not delivering the message as effectively as we should. But certainly. Uh, uh, if if this doesn't turn into a billion dollar business in the next 10 years, we definitely will have failed miserably. I believe it will, just because the market is becoming more and more receptive to it. 10 years? Yes. You're pretty well on your way. Well, we're not. We're only a fifth of the way, so. <laughs> All right. 20% per year, right? Is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you've said. Yeah. Um, what are you most proud of? of? The people that we work with. Oh my God, you mm -hmm. know that to build a team like uh, people like we have, and and to see them equally as inspired as we are, and that they love coming to work every single day. You know that might be naive, but I can say truthfully, at least eighty percent of our people they love where they work. 
We lost a person here, here just the other day, right here in Kelowna. Her name is Andrea. She's worked with us for about four or five years. And she got a better opportunity to work somewhere else, you know. And uh, we're so happy for her because, you know, her as an individual, you should be very selfish. You should think about what's the best for you and your family. And to see her have this opportunity and to see that she can grow into that opportunity, that just makes us extremely happy and that realize that we had a part in her growth and her career. Mm -hmm. I, I would echo exactly that, the mm -hmm. folks that we work with yeah. and seeing them. And their passion for what we're doing. Yeah. It's amazing some of the stuff they come up with. It is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's open it up now to questions from everybody else. And on Twitter, if, if someone does have a question on Twitter, please tweet away. Don't mind me. I'm just going to send out a tweet right now about the event. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned that uh, a lot of the construction happening is essentially garbage. And so I'm wondering, what's the best we can do? What's, what's your vision? What's, what will be the absolute best look like? Well, here's our value proposition. Right now, when you build something here in Cologne or anybody in conventional construction, you're paying 70% for labor and 30% for materials. The only way you can make it cheaper is to cheapen the materials. For every four tradesmen that are retiring, there's only one new one coming in, and they don't have that 30 or 40 years of experience. Our proposition is 80% materials, which means we're working with a much higher grade of materials and 10% for, for labor, and that includes fabrication and installation. So to make it better, we have to increase, we have to improve the quality of the materials that we're using, whether it's insulation in your home or the quality of door or window that you use. We see it. So in the Okanagan, if there was ever a need for good windows, it's here, you know, as far as the thermal envelope that you create. And you know what? And the fact that you have to throw that money away for labor and you're not able to get superior materials, can't you see where that's the value proposition and what we're doing here? You mentioned uh, that uh, just because this is the way we did things last week doesn't mean it's the way it's going to be done next week. And uh, and you talked about empowering employees. Um, what are some metrics that constitute an improvement for you? And as far as the employees go, where do those metrics come from? Well, you know what? We, we look at, obviously, we're manufacturing. So we look at going from a big thing for us was four-week lead time to three-week lead time. So metrics we will look at will be client service related, you know, uh, reducing our deficiencies, reducing our throughput times, our response times uh, with our technology, with ICE, just, you know, more qualitative metrics in terms of user experience. How much were they able to use ICE in the process, whether the client empowered? So it can be a whole range of things. I would say, I guess what, what we're focused on is what are client-centric metrics, and that kind of goes back to some of our comments earlier. I was curious about your residential uh, aspirations. Are you guys looking at doing new builds and renovations or new builds only? And what is the price range? Are you looking at doing everything from low end to high end? We won't. Uh, our process will definitely work anywhere from low end to high end. High end. But I will take an example here of building a house in Kelowna. You see the outside of a house. Anybody can frame a house and actually whack in the windows and the doors and put a roof on it. It takes them maybe six weeks. But then it takes them another two years to finish the interior. Where we're strong is that we know how we do the interiors of buildings, the interiors of hospitals. So where we can change the proposition is that not just uh, – helping in a process for the exterior, because we're going to do that. You're going to see an incredible place that we're going to build at the rise here, you know, new clubhouse. And we found out that you can't make, our friend that bought the golf course has figured out, because he's already owned one, you cannot make money on a golf course. But you could actually make money if you built a clubhouse that would become a place that you could hold weddings and receptions and all that. Then that would subsidize the whole thing. And that's his whole plan. And so we're going to show how you can build something that if someone like in one of the best companies, Team Construction, built my home here 
in Kelowna. They built it in six and a half months in the year 2000. Today, if they tried to build it, it would take them two and a half to three years. The process has changed that much. And by using our approach of building most of it in factories and then bringing it on site, we'll be able to reduce the construction time by at least a third to your point of a price will definitely match the pricing that's out there. It'll be less money because we're actually building it much quicker and substantially better quality. Again, 80% materials, 20% labor versus 70% labor and 30% materials. And when you do new and uh, reno? Reno would be our biggest business. It already is in what we do. You know, you got it. You know, you pay the piper. We call those jobs called putting a shine on a turd. You know, you take everything on the inside and then we retrofit the inside of it. That's most of our business. Yeah. You, the one thing you have to think about our business and, and what we would take to the residential arena is when we build, you know, we, we say we build in our factory, but what we're really doing is we're building custom interiors, whether it's commercial or now moving into residential for you, because we have technology that allows us, everything we do is custom, it's just normal to us, but we get to use highly skilled and trained people in a controlled environment. Well, what do you think the outcome's going to be? It's going to be far superior. That, that's really what it boils down to. All right. Uh, uh, hi. Um, I've got uh, numerous different uh, aspects to this uh, question. Um, first of all, thank you as a, an original shareholder of DIRT. Um, thank you for steering the company to where it is. Uh, share price at 4.85. We're doing really well. Um, thank you for the uh, communication to your shareholders. Your information emails that come through are fantastic, so thank you for that. Um, and also thank you for how you deal with your partners. Um, I know Peter Crawley at uh, the PCC group, and he talks very highly of you guys and how you treat them, so thank you for that. Um, originally, you mentioned about uh, different industries and different countries that you're, you were working in or doing business in. How difficult was it not being dragged all over the place and just grabbing business as it goes along? Um, with startup companies, it's very easy just to grab business as it comes through. It's very easy because if we don't have a good local partner, like Scott was saying about Korea or Singapore, we don't even start. We could put our 20 best salespeople into the Middle East, including myself. We'd sell nothing there. We have a partner. They happen to be Lebanese, and they in turn have partner strategic relationships in Saudi Arabia with Saudi partners and in Kuwait with Kuwaiti partners and Qatar with Qatar partners. Uh, we have a lady in Singapore or her, that's totally wired in that community. You don't move in because we don't understand their cultures. We don't understand how they do business. You know, and, and so w until we see a strong partner in that region, we also make sure that they put skin in the game. You know, they, our partner just spent $1 million, over a million dollars for the show the Arab Health Show in Dubai. So, you know, we, it, until they're committed and we see that they're committed, we won't go into the market. I, you know, I'd, I'd add real quick, one, thank you for being a shareholder. Yeah. We work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, our shareholders are our partners. They're one of our stakeholders. But what I saw in Dubai when we were over there recently, it, we can all talk about partnership, but the investment that was made by our partner in the Middle East for the Arab Health Show, which is the world's largest healthcare show, it just, it, I don't know, it, it just reinforced that we truly have a partner, like a strong partner with connections in the region, but who is investing in our mutual business interests. Hi. It's very clear that uh, treating your employees well is an important business strategy for your company. And you talked about your employees being shareholders. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, maybe how early employee ownership started within the company and how that was fostered? Because right. <laughs> we took checks from all of them because we needed it. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that jokingly. Uh, they believed, you know, we, we allowed, when we, when we were private and small, we were probably like many of you in this room, we were constantly looking for capital. And so many of our employees, when I say they're shareholders, they are investors. They did write money. We have a, we have a young girl on our uh, factory floor in Calgary 
who invested, she bought 100 shares, uh, and it was around $3 or 250 I can't remember what the financing round was at. Um, and so probably, you, some companies might argue, well, wait a sec, that's, you know, lawyers, legal fees probably cost you more in paperwork. I heard that once that comment came to me, and I thought, that's the most ludicrous comment I've ever heard. Who's the best person if we're doing a tour, or who's one of our most loyal team members? You know, she, she's fantastic. Um, that being said, also, you know, one of the things about being a public company that is a benefit is we can have a stock option plan, an employee share purchase plan. Our stock option plan, all of our employees, the first thing we did actually when we bought Spider out here is all of the employees here were granted stock options in the company as a private company, every single one of them. That's just who we are. And also our employee uh, stock, they, if they buy a dollar worth of stock, we put in 50 cents. You mentioned uh, earlier that bureaucracy can turn into process, and process, as anybody knows who's been in a large company, can add a stifling layer to both productivity and innovation. Um, how do you combat that moving forward from a smaller company to a bigger company, combining the David with the Goliath, as it were? Well, our old company had 2,600 employees. This one has 880, you know, and the point is uh, uh, process is a good thing. Bureaucracy is a bad thing, and you have to fight it. You jump on it every single day. We had it just today. We had a big thing. My God, it was ridiculous. A, a client wanted a price on uh, an integrated technology in a wall, a computer screen in a wall with glass that we've done lots of times before but for some god-awful reason. We stifle them for three year, three days that we got to put it into engineering instead of our salesperson and our person saying, yes, we will do it. Here's the number and away you go. You know what? That's the kind of thing we can't sneak it, let sneak into our company. I, earlier you said if it's more expensive, it's not green. Could you unpack that? Yeah. It costs way less money to build green than it does uh, there's a difference between cost and price, big difference. And and if if it, it if you're building something that is worth nothing, why would you build it in the first place? Number one. Number two. When you look at you know the cost is what you get, the price is what you pay. And when we talk about what we do, we we haven't had a price increase since we started. You know, and our clients pay the same price as they did nine years ago. Uh, that's value in the proposition, whereas what we're up against, construction, like construction in, in our big, one of our bigger markets is Northern California, construction has doubled in the last 12 months and it's going to double again in the next 12 months. You know, all of a sudden you start to see the, these people that were standardizing conventional solutions, you know, now they can't even afford to do it. In fact, Google's going to make an announcement in the next two weeks they ain't going to use any more drywall. Because although that material is, what does it cost, 35 cents a square foot for drywall, they're realizing that tippage fees are $7,500 for a 45-yarder, and then that doesn't count the four or five guys on the broom. That's the real cost, as opposed to that price of 35 cents a square foot for the drywall. All right. Yeah. I think we will close it there then. Um, I want to thank you guys both for being here. It is a real pleasure that you're here with us tonight, um, but also here as a company in this community. Uh, you guys are clear supporters and leaders in this community. It is such a pleasure to, to have you uh, sort of share your stories with us tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.